Good evening. Oh, you must be here for the same reason I am. You are fans of Brad Terry. Yes? Yes. First of all, thank you for coming. This is the second talk in the series, uh, Talking Music in Maine, an Intimate Conversation. I would like to thank the Lincoln Theater for putting on these marvelous talks. Uh, and also, I would like to uh, thank our sponsor, which is Horch Roofing. So if we could please give a round of applause for Horch Roofing that sponsors this entire series. Uh, we did two this spring. We will do another two in the fall. Also, give a great hand for our two gentlemen up in the lighting booth, uh, Damon and Gary. They have done a marvelous job. This is a wonderful evening for me because out of all the guests that I have chosen to speak with me and to talk with me on this wonderful series, uh, this gentleman is the one I've known the longest. Uh, I met him way back in high school. We did not go to high school together, however, um, but I was in high school back in the 80s and he came to visit our high school and everybody was just a buzz because Brad Terry, the great clarinetist, was going to come and do a workshop on jazz. Uh, I had not been really introduced to jazz too very much because I lived in the backwoods of North Waldeboro. <laughs> yes, so uh, I'll let that one lie right there. But um, it was marvelous to do, and uh, we, we spent an afternoon with Brad, and I remember it vividly, uh, because during that jazz, I was seated at the keyboard, and we did, I think it was just a straightforward 12-bar uh, uh, jazz piece, and each time Brad chose a different person to take a lick or two, uh, and I was just so much into that music, I just couldn't contain myself. And Brad didn't say a word, he just kept pointing to different people, but he never pointed to me to take a lick. Um, but uh, I was just so much into the music that I couldn't contain myself, and uh, Brad just simply looked over to me and went, <laughs> hold it down. <laughs> it taught me a lot, that one little gesture. <laughs> Uh, that's probably why I used to play the organ so loud. When little old ladies used to say, you're playing too loud, I just played a little bit louder the next Sunday. So thank you, Brad, for that. <laughs> uh, but tonight we're going to go through a marvelous career, a marvelous life, and a life that has been not only devoted to making music, but also teaching music to wonderful children along the way. Um, so I'm not going to talk too much longer because all I'm going to do for the next hour or so is ask questions uh, and we're going to travel together through the life with Brad Terry. But first I'm going to introduce one of the most special guests of the evening. Uh, in fact, I'll just invite her out right now. Ella, would you please come out, Go ahead, dear? Go on. Ella, come on, sweetheart. Ready? <laughs> come on, sweetheart. Can you lie, lie down, down right here? Yes, there we are. Lie down. And this is Brad Terry. <laughs> lie down. Lie down. Lie down. Thank you. <laughs> we'll she, get to she, Ella in a little bit. She steals the throw all the time. I love it. It's yes. okay with you. And I've got dog hair all over me. All <laughs> yeah. Well, you're, this, this theater is no, you're no stranger to this theater because you've actually performed here. You, you performed here with a Whitner. With Gary Whitner. Yes. That's where I knew that I knew I'd been here. I was yeah. trying to remember. Okay, good. <laughs> they all blend in the sort of It's one all blending it's all blending evening. in. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. now before we start, uh, I, I'm going to reference your book quite a lot because I have been uh, reading it nonstop. I think <laughs> I made it through three times. This is a marvelous memoir that Brad has written about his life and career. I love the title. I feel more like I do now than I did yesterday which is marvelous. It's a collection of remembered stories. Uh, Brad has some here this evening, uh, but you certainly can uh, purchase this online. And what struck me almost immediately, Brad, is that you, you call your clarinet a horn. Well, I, yeah, it's a pretty generic, it, it is. You, you know, you blow air into one end of it. And, and right, right, and, and, that, and that struck me it, it, odd because it, in, I guess, my musical world, I usually call it a woodwind instrument mm -hmm. or something mm -hmm. along that line. Is that something in the jazz circle that I had missed? I, or? I think so, it seems to me Buddy Tate, uh, I was lucky enough to sit in with him, and he said, you just play a horn. 
Play your horn. Yeah, play your horn. Yeah, and I could be. I think he could be talking to a piano player. It didn't really matter. <laughs> <laughs> it just <laughs> didn't, pick, didn't matter. It just picked yeah, up your horn. Didn't matter. Well, speaking of playing, I'm just going to read off some names right off. You've played with such greats as Dizzy Gillespie, mm -hmm. Buck Clayton, uh, Buddy Tate, Steve Swallow, and Buddy DeFranco. You've recorded with John Basile, Lenny Bro. You've starred with Red Mitchell and Roger Kellaway. If you don't know who Roger Kellaway is, he wrote the uh, closing theme to All in the Family. Um, but let's start at the very beginning. You were born uh, June 9th, 1937. Yeah. This is not your life. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and now, you were told, though, that you were born in The Hague. Right. Is that true? That is absolutely true. Really? Yeah. And according to, you know, June 9th, 1937, I was, apparently I was there. You <laughs> and you grew up. In, I arrived. Let's and you grew way. up in Stanford, Connecticut. Yeah, my my parents were involved in international business, living in in Holland for from about 1932 until 1939. Right. <clears throat> and um, um, my they, and, and my older brothers all went to junior high school in Holland, and we came back to this country in 1939. And uh, and we, we, my father, <clears throat> I don't know where he got the information, but in May of 1929, he sold all his stock and bought a little farmhouse in Stanford, Connecticut. <clears throat> Everybody thought he was crazy. <laughs> and, uh, uh, crazy like a fox. Yeah. And uh, so we, we, had, we kept that. And actually, um, the Roswell Rudd, the trombone player, you've mm -hmm. probably heard of him, um, his family rented our house during those years. So Wonderful. I, I knew that. So it family. started early yeah, on. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you were yeah, destined. Yeah. Now I look up here, and the picture <clears throat> on the right is the first time you laid down your first tracks. <laughs> oh, oh, what? It's free. Whoa. It's free. You got in for free. What are you complaining about? <laughs> yes. That's, that's pretty good, actually. I that's mean, not that. bad. That's not yeah. bad. Yeah. Okay. So your first introduction to music. Um, probably is the same first introduction that everybody here in this audience over a certain age has experienced. The first introduction probably could have cost you your career in music because we've all had a teacher by the name of Mrs. McFarland who probably stunted the oh, that reason. Was, that was a little later on. I know, but we're going to jump around. We're not going to okay. go instantly into chronological. Yeah. But let's, uh, because we only have an hour, <laughs> okay. 1937 okay. Okay. to the okay. present, it's going to take a little while. Okay. Um, but Miss, Mrs. McFarlane was hired to teach your brothers, two brothers, piano. Yeah. And your mother said that she wanted you also to be taught formal training. Yeah, mother, mother started off my brothers. Right. And then pass them on to Mrs. McFarland. Mrs. And she McFarlane. wanted to, Mrs. McFarland to start with me from the beginning. Okay, so let's, <clears throat> let's go back a little bit and, and let's see what Mrs. McFarland said about you in music lessons. She said that you, in fact, she said this in front of you to mm -hmm. your mother mm -hmm. a hopeless case, <clears throat> no yeah. talent, no possibility of playing music at all, couldn't learn, couldn't be taught. Unteachable. That was the word, unteachable. Yeah. Or in the words of Louis Armstrong, you've got a perfect ear, there's just no hole in it. Yeah, that's... Right, <laughs> right, yeah. yeah. Did that discourage you at all? Um, no, I think, I mean, I've, I've, gosh, I was probably at least, in, at least in first grade by then, and I'd already heard that in kindergarten. You had? Yeah. yeah. Already in yeah, kindergarten? It's, it's an old story, it's an old story. But the, the first music I heard, uh, my mother played all the tunes of the 20s and 30s. <clears throat> my parents would, were married in 1923, mm -hmm. the height of that wonderful music period. And she played all of the tunes on the 20s and 30s. Um, and there was a, a couple of pillows and a blanket under the grand piano. And I went to sleep there. So eventually you ended up in bed somehow, but night after night. And I think by nine years old, I knew about 100 of those tunes in my head. Right. So that was, that's where it started, and bypassed Mrs. McFarland. <laughs> now, an interesting, uh, an interesting um, an anecdote about your mother is that she played the piano, but she could only play the black keys. Yeah, she played everything in F sharp, which F -sharp. is the worst key in the world for a clarinet. Right. Yeah. But Irving Berlin could only play on the black keys, too. Maybe that's where she got it. <laughs> I don't know. Would she, um, 
Normally, when people play on the black keys, they only use the thumb for the melody. Is that how she plays? I don't know. I don't know. No? I don't know. Yeah. I now, was under the piano most you, of the time. That's right. How could you tell? <laughs> um, your grandmother, on your father's side, what was her nickname? Well, she was, she was Julia Terry. And my, my, on, my, on my father's side. Was she also musical? She was very musical. And she played the guitar, and she had a wonderful um, singing voice. And, um, um, and she was quite, a, quite an extraordinary. She, uh, uh, back during the Depression, she, uh, uh, they lived in Short Hills, New Jersey. And uh, she was working as a volunteer in a soup kitchen. And um, somebody came in who couldn't see to fill out the forms. So she found an old pair of magnifying glasses at home and brought them in. And uh, that was during the Depression. In 1939, uh, Short Hills had to build a new post office room. Uh, it's an organization called New Eyes for the Needy. And she started that entire thing. They produce glasses for literally millions of people all over the world now. Mm. And uh, she started it in her kitchen. So that was, that was her legacy. Wow. And, um, that was your father's mother. That was my father's, my father's mother, yeah. I remember her, I think I was, I think she, she died when I was only five or six years old. I didn't know my grandfather at all on that side of the family. I chuckled because I, in your book you called her Big Granny. That was, yeah, she was big, well, and, and my, my uncle who was, <clears throat> well, she, she was, he was called Little Lawrence, and my father was, the older brother, and he was the um, Lawrence Terry, who was headmaster of Middlesex School for generations, and six foot seven or something like that, a great big tall guy. And my grandmother was a large lady, so. Yeah. <laughs> large lady, Marshall Dodge, we call her a large lady. Large, yeah, large yeah. with an H. <laughs> um, would you share with the audience what you did instead of play baseball during gym class? Oh God, you're really digging in here. Um, <laughs> No, I had, a, I had a funny visual thing, you know, when, you, when, when, when something's coming at you, your eyes tend to cross so that you can just so you focus in on it, and mine wouldn't do it, and so I'd stand there like that and get beaned in the head with the baseball enough times that I gave up, and uh, I'd, I'd sit out in the middle, of the middle of the field, way out as far as I could get with a recorder, with my back to home plate and just stay there and just play tunes, and that, that never, <laughs> I, could, I never hit the ball, never, ever was able to hit it. That's discouraging after a while. <clears throat> so that's... Was that the impetus? Well, I think, uh, uh, I mean, I started, I started fooling around with a, with a soprano recorder, mm -hmm. playing what tunes I knew in my head by ear. And um, I, still, I still, once in a while, with uh, Peter, we'll, we'll do a bossa nova with a ukulele and a recorder. It's kind of good fun. <laughs> <laughs> but no one's throwing baseballs at you. Nobody's no. throwing baseballs at me. Okay. Yeah. Well, could you please tell us the story as to how you were introduced from the recorder to the clarinet by way of a Connecticut neighbor? Well, um, my mother was also not shy about talking to people. <clears throat> and um, at some point she met Benny Goodman at a, some kind of a thing and said, what do I do? I've got this 13-year-old who won't do his homework and doesn't go to school and all he does is play a recorder by ear. What do I do with him? And Benny said, get him a clarinet. And uh, the deal was at the local music store, if you bought the instrument, you got three free lessons. And that was it. That was the beginning of my music career and the end of my academic career simultaneously. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have any interaction with, with, Benny? with, with Benny? Later on. Later yeah, on. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I had, I suppose you'd call them lessons. I had three lessons with him, which were non-productive, because he was not a good teacher, and he was also demanding that I do things that I, I couldn't come close to jumping through the hoops he wanted me to jump so through. So uh, um, I, I couldn't. It didn't work out well. But I knew him on a different, <clears throat> sort of a different level. The the lesson was exactly an hour long, almost to the second, and then his whole attitude changed, and we go out and we'd go for a swim and we'd uh, get the grill going or maybe he had something wrong with his, with his uh, little golf cart and he was a completely different person than he was in the studio. And I got a chance to see that other side, which is interesting. Because, uh, you know, nightmare stories have been written about him and some of the terrible things that happened. Well, any band leader, Artie Shaw, he was no picnic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs>
right? Well, but I don't know. Everybody loved Woody Herman, and everybody loved sure. Count Basie. Right. True. No. True. And not all of them were bad. So, <laughs> so in 1952, in 1952, with a great pianist and vocalist, Fred Fisher, you get your first New Year's Eve gig. Yeah, he was, I think he was 13 and I was 15. <laughs> we had a, 13 and 15. Yeah, and he, uh, we had the Benny Goodman, we, we'd been, we were Benny Goodman clones. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had, he had the, all the Teddy Wilson left hand stuff pretty well down at the age of 13. And uh, yeah, we, we, we knew 12 songs. <laughs> and we played them very fast and we played them very slow. And we made a couple of them into waltzes and got through a New Year's Eve gig. <laughs> Manage, and uh, and that was that was he's he's still very active. He's uh, uh, lives in New Jersey, and I mm -hmm. see him from time to time. He's a wonderful player, a wonderful friend. And from what I understand, from '52 to '55, you played wherever and whenever you could. Yeah, he had had uh, uh, polio when he was 11. He got serious polio, and uh, <coughs> still had you know, crutches and braces um, forever. And we used to go to gigs on my motor scooter. And uh, I remember he'd, 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 hold the, he'd hold the crutches this way until we got into traffic and I'd be weaving through cars and he'd have to hold, it, hold the crutches over there. And he was game to go anywhere. He was fearless, you know, hop on a motor scooter and go to a gig. He couldn't walk, but, he, but uh, he could ride a motor scooter. So he's a wonderful, and wonderful friend still now, I, you know, still very active. Right. <coughs> um, Going back to Benny, just for a little bit, um, there's a story, a little anecdote, that I don't know if Benny knows this, I don't know if you ever told him, but in a way, uh, Benny got you into Salisbury. No, not, not, uh, no, I don't, no, that was my uncle. No, 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 I, I, I'm going to explain it. Oh, please don't, okay, because you, you got me lost here. Yeah. I mean, I went to so many schools. I, I can back this up. <clears throat> At the age of 58, I discovered I've had major league ADD all my life. And I've been to more schools than most people can name. And Salisbury, my uncle, who was the headmaster of Middlesex, uh, my parents were traveling, and that's why I was off in boarding school. And his job was to pick me up at whichever school I'd been kicked out of and deliver me to the next one, because he knew, he knew all the headmasters. He never invited me to Middlesex. <clears throat> and um, so he was, but I, I'm not sure that Benny, well, the, 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 uh, the Mozart you're thinking of, is yeah. that the story? Oh, okay. I'm seeing how this is going around. You here. see. Yeah. <clears throat> so you had to take an exam. Yeah, well, I, it's the only time I have ever had a music class for credit, and I, and actually it was being taught by the by the a piano teacher, and um, it's also the only time I ever tried to play a classical piece. It was a, a not the whole thing, but part of the Mozart clarinet concerto, or quintet, I guess it was. I'm not sure now. And um, I struggled and struggled and struggled and absolutely could not figure out the, all the notes on the paper, and uh, I found a, a recording of Goodman playing it and got the thing and listened to it and learned it by ear. And then, in one uh, week? Yeah, I had about a week to learn the part that, I wasn't doing much of it, I mean, it wasn't a, it wasn't a huge amount to learn. And, uh, and, and I remember um, I trotted out on the, on the stage with my uh, clarinet in one hand and a music, hand, music stand and set everything up very carefully. And then, uh, of course, I played it with my eyes closed because I, and then I, never, realized, I never learned to read music anyway. So. Then you realized you had your eyes closed. Yeah, I, I, somebody must have caught on. I passed the course, I guess. The only, I think it was the only grade I passed that year. Was the, but they must have, known, faking, you, faking they must have known you weren't reading the music because yeah, your yeah. eyes were closed. Well, that was a, the, the, the cat was out of the bag at that point, I guess. Oh, God. So in uh, 1957, at the age of probably 19, 19 or 20, yeah, 57 would be 20. Yeah. yeah. You're hired as a ringer driver mm -hmm. and uh, for gigs in New York City. And you play at Eddie Condon's. Mm -hmm. Well, that was the Yale Band. Yeah, right. Yeah. And uh, two for the money with the Yale Band. Just mm -hmm. hadn't read that far. Yeah. And on one occasion, you're told to drive to the corner of Lexington and 125th Street to pick up who? Well, as a, as a ringer, I, I got a, a gig with a Yale Dixieland band. 
And um, I think the reason I got the gig was that I had a reliable station wagon. I, I don't think it was my clarinet playing. <clears throat> and uh, Eddie Condon used to double up on instruments, to have two trumpets and two trombones. And, and we did the same thing with the Yale Band. And I picked up um, Buck Clayton, uh, Buddy Tate, Dickie Wells, Rex Stewart, and uh, Joe Jones. These are big, These are big all, names. All Basie, all Basie. Uh, Buddy Tate was with Basie for 12 years, and Buck Clayton played with Benny and played with everybody. He was all. And you're 19 place. or 20. I was uh, just turning 20. Yeah. All right. You're going into. Harlem I had to have gigs. been at least 18 because I was driving in New York. Right. So, um, and and yeah, and I picked him up, um, um, and we went and did the Yale up in, up to New Haven. It was a Sunday Sunday gig. And then Buddy Tate, at that point, has his uh, own band at the place called the Celebrity Club on 125th Street. And uh, he invited me in, and uh, he told me to double park the station wagon on fr in front of the club with the keys in the ignition. And being the color that I was and in the middle of Harlem, I wasn't going to argue with anybody. And um, I was a little nervous about that, and he put me on the bandstand with Buck Clayton here and Buddy Tate and Major Holly playing bass and these incredible thing. And he said, play your horn <laughs> with a couple of expletives. And, um, I, and all of a sudden, here's this Count Basie rhythm section. Just, uh, I couldn't believe it. And um, I came back a couple of hours later and the car was parked on the other side of the street, headed the other way. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and Buddy, Buddy was the mayor of, of Harlem. Everybody knew him. He knew everybody. And there were practically every corner a little organ trio. A guy playing a Hammond organ and a tenor saxophone player and a drummer with a snare and a hi-hat. And he'd push me into the door and, and go up to the guy and say, he's, he's going to play. And sometimes he would play, but he, he, he just told the guy that I was going to be playing. And all the tunes were, <clears throat> they were either blues oriented or sort of I Got Rhythm or Honeysuckle Rose, kind of a lot of that kind of stuff. And my ear was good enough, even if I couldn't pick up the original tune, I was able to improvise on the chord changes pretty easily. And um, I don't know how many nights I spent on the, floor, in the sleeping bag on his kitchen floor. And uh, 18, 19 years old, and that opened up that whole, that whole thing. I really think I never would have gotten anywhere playing music if it hadn't been for Buddy. For Buddy Tate. Yeah, I would have you know, maybe played on the weekends or something, but I never would have done it. Yeah. And um, so I owe a whole lot to. For the audience. That's that's Buddy playing the saxophone there, and Buck Clayton, who is um, also one of the one of I think still one of my favorite trumpet players of all time. Trumpet player. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, well, I had that uh, gig up in Vermont at the Sugarbush Inn for a couple of winters, and they came up for an entire week mm -hmm. and stayed with us and played. Yeah. Whew, what, a, what, what a treat. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. I've been incredibly lucky that these guys, you know, they're put up with this. I was a skinny kid then. Can you believe that? <laughs> <laughs> I, it's well, they obviously sheer, saw something. Sheer luck. It had nothing to do with anything except luck, I think. Yeah. So you have played with, with many of the greats and, seen, and you've seen even more and experienced even more. Um, but I, reading in your book, um, it seemed to be that there were two little instances that uh, seemed to have a little impression on you. One that was humorous that I'd like you to share with the audience just because it's um, uh, a little telling anecdote. And then there's another one that's quite prophetic. Um, so the first story uh, is one that you heard from a bass player, um, Abdul Malik about an uptown patron who was listening to Thelonious Monk play. Oh, that's a, that's a, wild, that's a wild thing. Um, which I love. I absolutely, yeah. which I, this is one yeah. of my favorite jazz stories of yeah, all time. Well, well I, think, I think that was at the five spot. Because there's, there's a teacher, there's a student of mine who's out in the audience, I hope, that is going to get quite a lot from this story. Uh -huh. Okay, uh -huh. so if you tell well, it. Well, Thelonious Monk, I mean, a, a lot of what he was playing back then, and, and frankly, even some of the stuff that's recorded that I'm listening to now um, just went over the top of my head. <clears throat> but uh, he did write some amazing tunes. But um, yeah, the story goes that there was this, this uh, hippie guy who was, you know, knew what was going on, and his uptown friend. And they're at the five spot listening to the music. 
And uh, the rhythm section is going ding, 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 ding. And Monk is sort of slow, you know, scrunched down over the piano with his head down and, and about five or six choruses and doesn't play at all. Just nothing, nothing, nothing. Just sitting there and the rhythm section is going ding, 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 ding. And then all of a sudden he looks up and the whole room went into fantastic applause. And, and the, the, guy, the, the, the guy from uptown said, what, what was that all about? He, he didn't play a note, he didn't play a note. And his friend said, well, just imagine what he must have been thinking. <laughs> That's just so, it. <laughs> I love that story. <clears throat> and if you have to go home and ask, what was that story about? <laughs> yeah, what is it? Just what was he thinking? I, I, I wonder about this one all the time. I wonder, yeah. wonder what she's thinking. So uh, the second one, though, um, was the time you saw Prez Lester Young the great mm -hmm. tenor saxophonist perform. Yeah. And it made a lasting impression on you. Yeah, um, I had heard all about Lester Young. Um, I'd heard his recordings. Um, he was obviously um, one of Stan Getz's great influences. There's some, there's an old recording, I can't remember which one it is, but there's an introduction, saxophone introduction to a blues by Lester Young. And, and 30 years later, there's a, Stan Getz's almost note for note, the same thing. So they had a tremendous, um, influence on, well, everybody who came along afterwards. And I was excited, it was a concert, I think, at Randall Island in New York. They had these big outdoor concerts. And I was all excited because I'd heard him play and, and, uh, and he was very, very sick and really couldn't play. And it was just a terrible disappointment. And um, that's something that I've been looking at as I get to be so old uh, that, um, I, I don't want to ever get to the point where I can't play. I hope somebody will tell me if I'm not doing it. If I don't know myself, right. I'm relying on somebody to say, eh, you better pack it up, now it's time. You don't want that to be the last <clears throat> no, image. No. Well, it, uh, uh, I'm lucky enough to, to uh, play a bit and know uh, Buddy DeFranco, the clarinet player. Mm -hmm. Who, by the way, Buddy DeFranco uh, made a, a recording with Art Tatum when he was 17 years old. But you didn't know that. I did not know that. <laughs> and, wow. he was, and he was the top, I mean, he played just brilliantly, amazing guy. And a, and a sweet, uh, he and his wife came and spent a whole week with us in Krakow at the International Clarinet Festivals. I took them to Auschwitz. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, uh, and then I visited him. Uh, he had a place in Whitefish, Montana, when I had the Polish kids here for the summer. We went and sat and played, set up in his garage and played tunes with him. It was pretty exciting. <laughs> but uh, he, uh, he made a, you know, he said, when I turn 90, I'm going to stop playing. And he played a concert, I think, fairly shortly before his birthday, mm -hmm. when he turned 90, and he quit playing, at, and he was at the top of his game. Yeah. And uh, he lived, he had some health problems, and I think he died about two years later. Mm -hmm. But um, I've been in situations where people, I, I think it happens to singers that, you, know, you, you get somebody like Tony Bennett, who still sounds wonderful, but singers, at a certain point, they lose the voice, and it's better that they just, you know, don't do it anymore. And sort of know, know when to quit. I think it's important. Right. When it's, yeah. right. And a friend of mine, I, don't, I can't see who's out there, but a friend of mine um, had told me that when I reached 80, uh, I had reached the eighth floor. And it's an interesting way of looking at things, that uh, you reach the eighth floor, and the view is a little different up here. Mm. And it is. And I have a sense of urgency about, I think, realistic sense of urgency about wanting to get things done. I've got some recording projects I want to do and get going. Um, I want to play all the time. I want to get as much music done as I can while I can. Right. And, uh, and that's sort of what, what drives me to keep going. Right. I know. As we were driving here, we saw an accident on Route 1. You just never know what yeah. tomorrow will bring. Yeah. 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 Uh, so, right around 1965, we're mm -hmm. jumping ahead a little bit, right around 1965, in a parking garage in Manhattan, <laughs> you had just finished a jam session, yeah. and while waiting for your car, you just haphazardly started to whistle, mm -hmm. and the acoustics in that Manhattan garage were so incredible, tremendous reverberation. Oh, it was beautiful, yeah. 25 to 30 people had started gathering around you <laughs> on the platform. Somebody started honking the horn down the bottom because they were blocking. Honking the horn. <laughs> and afterwards, they began, they began applauding. Yeah, yeah. 
Can you tell? Can you elaborate well, more? Well, that's. That um, it was a thing called Jazz at Noon, mm -hmm. uh, run by a fellow. His name is Les Lieber. I think he just celebrated his hundred and fifth birthday. Oh. And he had a thing called Jazz at Noon. It was made up of businessmen who possibly could have been professional musicians if they'd done it, but they decided to earn a living instead. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that they were bankers and doctors and lawyers and all this, but good players. <clears throat> and uh, he would hire a professional bass player, and then he would hire all kinds of people. If you look them up online, Jazz at Noon, uh, uh, Benny Goodman played there, Dizzy played there, Roger Kelly, uh, name it, who's who of people who played for 50 bucks on a Friday afternoon and got a free lunch. And I went there sitting in early on and then ended up actually the last 10 years it was running about, about once a year I was the actual guest, paid guest. But uh, yeah, and I, I, you know, I've been playing music and it was sounded fun and I, you know, I started, and, whoa, and it sounded great. So I decided um, at that point to, uh, to try and do it once in a while when I was actually, oh, Ellen, no, that's not your signal. You, no, 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 come on, come on, lie down, lie down. Lie down, lie down. Come on, come on. Come on, come on, lie down. That's a girl, that's a girl. W.C. Fields. <laughs> Never work with children or animals. <laughs> um, however, that's not j the end of the story because you are recognized as one of the great. <laughs> I know you're going to chuckle, but this is true. You're one of the greatest in the world. <clears throat> you have been written about in such media as the LA Times and Downbeat Magazine, who um, called you the finest jazz whistler in the world. Uh, I had asked you earlier before, because I have seen you do this, uh, and I don't know if, you, if the audience knows what this means, because there are only a few musicians in the world that can do this. Wynton Marsalis is one. Many trumpeters know how to do this. But it's called circular breathing, um, where you breathe in while you're also producing a sound. Uh, uh, not, no, no, not quite. Not quite. Well, I, no, but I, I mean, you're doing in, I whistle blowing in and coming in, like a harmonica player. Right, exactly. Yeah, so yeah, he's, yeah. he's pulling in and still producing the sound yeah. as well, not blowing in through the, the nose and yeah. going back yeah. out. But yeah. as you whistle, you're blowing yeah. in and blow, yeah. pulling back yeah. in and, and, yeah. and whatnot. Um, so what I, uh, what I would love to do um, is pull up this slide right here just for a second because we're actually going to listen <laughs> to uh, uh, Brad uh, whistle, but I would like to ask you, um, when we were putting up these slides, a gentleman asked me, why does Brad do this? Now I know in choral, I know many singers who put their hand up to their it's ear. Same reason, for sure. Okay, could you explain to the audience what this actually <clears throat> well, is? You, you, can, you can give yourself a little test if, you, if you're talking and you put your hand up to your ear while you're talking. You're hearing the sound this way. Um, the whistling and the clarinet too. Um, the clarinet, when I'm playing it, uh, it doesn't sound anything like it sounds outside. Um, like your voice, you listen to your voice on a tape and say, well, who is that? It doesn't sound like you at all. But that enables me to, to uh, keep the intonation and, and listening to it. Um, if I'm whistling through a PA system, there's enough of a delay that by the time it gets out there and comes back to me, it, I, I, I haven't had a chance to adjust the pitch. <laughs> and there are, no, there, there are no frets, there are no buttons to push when you're whistling. You just sort of, it's a pretty, pretty open range there. So, uh, um, and that was the, that was the I, and I, I don't know exactly how I do it. I mean, how I actually make the articulation. I'm not sure how, I'm not, I can't explain how it works. I'm just going da -ga -da -ga -da -ga -da with my tongue and, it's, it's, and, the, and the notes come out. I don't, I don't understand it. Well, let's <clears throat> listen to some of that da -ga -da -ga -da -da. <laughs> This is uh, a performance that you did with uh, Joachim Menzel, mm -hmm. who you, have, you did perform with for almost 20 years yeah. uh, in Poland. And this is just a little taste of not only you playing your clarinet with him, but also whistling. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay.
<laughs> yeah. that, that's a tune called All Alone by the Telephone. It comes from the 1920s, and it's one of the first tunes that I remember my mother playing. Mm. And we, Yaki, I taught it to Yaki, and it was one of our starter tunes. We like to play it. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's wonderful I, pianist. Yeah, he's wonderful. Fantastic, yeah, yeah, all yeah, of those jazz yeah, musicians. Yeah. Wonderful. Yaki, I met at a at, on my second trip to Poland, mm. and uh, he was ch checking out the piano, and I was sort of concerned to see if my clarinet was in tune with international pianos and things. And yeah. We started noodling around and changing ideas, and, and formed a duo. It's been doing it ever since. He's a, a remarkable. And even though you've worked with him for 20 years, going back and forth to Poland for mm. almost 20, mm. even more. You told me this evening that you don't speak Poland, Polish. Well, his English is very good. And, right. Uh, and his, um, yeah, the, the um, <clears throat> more and more Poland is, is, is becoming um, anglicized, is that yeah. the word? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, people are, are speaking English. And, and uh, he also speaks German and Russian mm -hmm. as well as Polish. And, uh, wow. and, uh, but he's a, a, a wonderful composer. He's got a, a, a Christian band. It's called New Live Music. Mm -hmm. And they uh, they travel all over Poland, all over the place. He writes wonderful sort of mamas and papas kind of um, um, blood, sweat, and tear kind of tunes. Mm. Um, his wife writes the lyrics out of the Polish Bible, and it swings like crazy. <laughs> oh God, it is such fun. And, uh, yeah. uh, so b before we go any further, um, let's reveal something to the audience that maybe a lot of you don't know. If you know Brad or have known Brad for many years. Uh, you might know this, but to many of you, you might find this shocking. Um, to some jazz mu musicians, you might not find this shocking at all. Uh, Brad is very forthright in coming in, in telling this, but Brad does not read music. Has never known how to read music. Hmm. Not from day one. In fact, that was the one reason um, that music kind of, you, you just went in your own improvisational way, and that was the reason why you had to pick up that Benny Goodman record to mm -hmm. learn the Mozart. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so you described it uh, wonderfully in an interview once, not in your book, in an interview, that you have a five-year-old who speaks in sentences. Mm -hmm. He can't read the words, spell the words, diagram the sentences, doesn't know a noun from a verb, but he can talk to you. And basically, you play music the way a five-year-old talks. Yeah. The, the scale, the mode, the key that's in, it's all irrelevant information. I don't need to know any of that. Right. I mean, I'd like to be able to read, I'd love to be able to read well enough to learn new tunes, mm -hmm. but that's not going to happen. I, as I mentioned, when I was 58, I was diagnosed with major league ADD along, and it, dyslexia went along with that. Mm -hmm. And um, I just look at the things and it just doesn't make any sense. Um, but in the jazz world, that's not that uncommon to not know how to read music. Yeah, I think I, among the older, the, I mean, uh, um, uh, Errol Garner was, didn't read because he couldn't really see it. Art Tatum right. couldn't see, almost couldn't see at all. Right. And he was, uh, obviously didn't read music. And I played a lot. I, I had a gig in Vermont with a trio at the Sugarbush Inn um, and with a piano player and a drummer. And um, the only way to keep from going crazy was to learn new tunes because we were playing six hours a night, six days a week. Two hours a happy hour and four hours a night, six times a week. <laughs> <laughs> and I got back to New York, patting myself on the back. Yeah, I know a lot of tunes. Until I met this piano player, Eddie Thompson, who was a blind English piano player, and absolutely, and he knew more tunes than I've ever anybody I've ever known. And obviously, didn't read music. <laughs> 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 and uh, I, I get it. I have to tell it because this is a story that just he um, he'd been blind since birth. Um, he was fearless. He was. Uh, he went all over New York City with his guide dog by himself on the subway. Uh, lived out in Queens and commuted on the subway by himself. And uh, he also had a relentless sense of humor and had absolutely no tolerance for blindness as a handicap. He just didn't consider it as a handicap. And I have to tell this story because I just love it. He, he talked about this blind guy selling pencils on the subway. And every day a commuter gets off the train and puts 10 cents in the tray and never takes a pencil. It's been going on for a long time. So one day the guy says, excuse me, are you the guy that puts 10 cents in the tray and never takes a pencil? And the guy said, yeah, I am. And he said, well, I just want to let you know the pencils are 15 cents now. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
one of my, one of my top favorite stories. And uh, there, he had other ones that I can't tell in public. But. <laughs> Isn't that a great, that's really a great story, I love it. Just, and the, it, he had this wonderful clipped British accent in the way he said it, and he was such glee in his voice when he said it. Anyway. <laughs> so another thing that, that you talk quite a bit about is that in the summer of 1994, at the age of 57, you were diagnosed with attention deficit disorder. Right, right. And it really opened up your world entirely. Yeah. Because not yeah. only did it validate you at the time, but it also validated your entire life up to that moment from your childhood to yeah. then. Because yeah. when you, re you received that diagnosis, you then looked back on your childhood schooling, uh, how difficult it was in learning. Mm -hmm. um, it answered almost every question you had about yourself. Um, yeah, I'd been, from, from kindergarten on, um, they, they, I was, they thought I was lazy and stupid. And you got that reinforcement, that was it, like, constantly. Inattentive, unable Thank God to. my parents just, I was number four, I had three older brothers, and they, I think they just gave up and they said, you know, don't fuss, let him do his thing and don't worry about it. And, uh, and you, were, you were labeled inattentive, unable to concentrate, doesn't apply himself, mm -hmm. um, impossible to understand certain things such as math. Uh, but what I found humorous, that you were bored, you, you were, when uh, you enjoyed singing sevenfold amens, but, you, but singing other simple songs over and over again bored you. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I, well, I, well, with my first clarinet, I had one of those little things with the music stand that you look at this right here in front of you. And, and, and uh, I couldn't pay attention. And I was in this little silly school band, and, and I was making up harmony lines that I liked better than... I, I don't know if it was better than it was written down, but it was, that's what I was playing. Yeah. And I got that. I think um, there was a lot of singing going on at my house. As I said, I had three older brothers. My mother played the piano. And um, I can remember, I think fairly young, sitting on the piano bench with three older brothers behind me, and we're trying to sing. And if I landed on somebody's note, and I'd, 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 get, a, um, I'd get a knuckle on the head. Mm. You know, and I'd listen around, and I oh, nobody's got this note. I'll grab that one, and so I, that helped me learning the clarinet. I do the same thing there. That I, if I hear a chord, if if I hear a note that's not in that chord that will fit, that's that's the one I'm looking for. And it's sort of that's where it all developed from. And what's so amazing is with with the ADD, which all through many of the chapters of your book, when you were younger, it was you. It, it was such a struggle to sit and concentrate oh. on certain things. Oh. And yet, in a week's time, you learn the, the first movement of the Mozart Concerto by listening to Benny Goodman play mm -hmm. a record. You also, when you were cast as Peter Pan in a school <laughs> production... This is typecasting. You knew, <laughs> you knew all your lines. You knew all your fellow cast members' lines. You knew, my wife is laughing. <laughs> Was that you, Kristen? Yep. This is because she, this is exactly like my wife. She knew, you knew all your lines, you knew all your fellow cast members' lines, you knew all the songs, you knew the stage direction, you knew the lighting cues, and yet you say you don't remember studying the script. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Well, and at the same time that was going on, the English teacher, there was a 16 line poem by Edna St. Vincent Benet mm -hmm. that I was supposed to recite at the assembly, and I, I couldn't learn it, and mm. I tried, and I tried, and they'd make me get up every, every Friday, to, and I'd get halfway through it and then dissolve in tears because I couldn't remember it. Meanwhile, learning the entire Peter Pan script. It made no sense, and it still doesn't, you know. Well, do you, think it, do you think it had something to do with the interest of it? Do you have selective ADD? <laughs> No, I didn't mean that humorously, I, because... No, I, no because that may I be the definition of ADD. Is, 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 I think it is selective. I, because because I know growing up that I, I, I can remember the day of graduation, Ronald Dolloff at Madomic Valley High School called me at 3 o'clock and said, get your robe on, because he pulled strings to get me through high school, because it didn't interest me. Yeah. But I remember and would learn musical things and things that interested yeah. me. Now, people yeah. might have said, well, he's just lazy, he doesn't want to learn that. 
but mm. it, you know, I don't know if I was undiagnosed, but it, it obviously was selective. Well, on my I mean, I, I made four serious attempts uh, to learn to read music. Mm. I took extension division courses at Juilliard, at Yale Music School, at the London Conservatory, and at the Mozarteum in Salzburg, all trying <laughs> desperately to learn to read music. And I tried and tried and tried and tried, and I, you know, and they, I, I was playing, I think, a clarinet better than the other kids in the class, but they could read the music, and what was wrong with me? Yeah. And so, so uh, uh, you, you, you know, you start from the beginning getting negative yeah. stuff from yeah. kindergarten on up, and it takes a long time. Uh, I read the uh, Ned Hallowell book mm -hmm. called Driven to Distraction. Right. And, and I found out ADD, I ran a boys camp for 25 years, I don't know if we're gonna get into that, but one of my campers showed up years later with his own kids, and we were sitting around a campfire, and he said he had ADD, and one of his boys did, and he started telling me about it, and I said, hmm, sounds, sounds like a story I've heard before somewhere along the line. So that's when I went on my own to get diagnosed. And the Hallowell book, um, first of all, there was relief, that I wasn't lazy, I wasn't stupid, there was a real thing, it, it exists, other people have it. And they said that I would be angry, which I was, and I was not prepared for how long it took me not to be angry. Mm -hmm. I was really angry for a long, long, long time. And then I started thinking, because a lot of negative things happened to me. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I, I started thinking that being angry does not accomplish anything. Does make does not get the doesn't make the situation better, but um, and so and I was realizing that the people that did these negative things to me were trying their best to do the right thing and they just didn't know, and so how can you be angry with them? You got it. And I had to get over that. It took a long time, and then you get to the point where just okay, I'm not going to read music ever, and that doesn't make me a bad person, and it takes a long time to come to grips with that whole idea, and I'm not ever going to learn how to speak Polish. <laughs> Ain't, ain't gonna happen. <laughs> if, I, if I learn, a, I, this, this trip coming up will be number 22 or 23, I think. And if, if, I, if I learn a word a year, I'm on a roll. You know, I just, I, I can't do it. And so, okay, so they, they know that and they laugh at me and we have a good time. <laughs> well, knowing that, you, you have thousands of tunes obviously stored in your memory because of this. And even though you can't read or write music, have you ever tried your hand at writing a tune? No. Never? Never. I, I did write one time, I, I wrote a, a chart out of the melody and the chord mm -hmm. for a tune that I wanted. And I've only done it once. It took me a week. But not write it out, but have you ever, have you ever composed a melody just by sitting down no. and playing it? No. Never? Well, some of the stuff on the Lenny Bro CD, the, there's a blues thing that we made up on the spot, so I okay. guess I composed it. Right. So, yeah. so in some way, yeah. yeah. But after and, all these years, and there's some things I do with the Akim that are that are free improvisations, but it's it's composing on the spot. Compo right, right. And I think I guess I guess I'm doing it all the time because I'm I'm stealing George Gershwin's chord changes, but I'm making up music that fits. Right. So I guess I'm composing. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But there's never been a track that you said, oh, "Well, I wrote this for." No. 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 Okay. And so, you don't you don't get royalties for that anyway. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, so when, when you were asked why Poland, you answered? Well, um, at that, I know what you're talking about, the, the, uh, the thing on Vimeo, uh, the interview, um, and it was this, this piano player that you just heard. Um, Joachim Menzel. Joachim, Joachim Menzel, yeah. Um, yeah. And that was one of these things, that's a, a juncture in my life that, that uh, I was involved with the main jazz camp. And we had a last minute replacement trombone player from Texas State. The guy who was supposed to be there called the night before camp. Something happened to his mother and he couldn't make it and he was sending a substitute. And it was a guy by the name of Izzy Rudnick. And he told me he had kids playing jazz in Poland and I bought an airplane ticket to go see for myself and fell in love with it. <laughs> Never looked back. And that's been, nine, 1991 it was my first trip there. Right. Yeah. And uh, that was extraordinary. I fell in love with the whole place and the people. And I've been lucky to, to uh, um, I've been only there a couple of days and 
the, the, uh, this friend of mine had a chance to take his entire ensemble to Russia for a week. And I didn't know anybody, and the parents and the kids and the, the chaperones, they were all going. And he arranged for the Polish Jazz Society, literally to babysit, take care of me. And I found my way back to the club in Warsaw. And we got on a bus and went to a little town called Szedlce, near the Russian border, where they had a standards festival. And standards, those are the tunes, the standard jazz tunes. That's my repertoire, that's what I know. And I heard some of the darndest players I've ever heard. Mm -hmm. And there was a jam session that I got a chance to play. That was Friday night. The director of the festival asked me to play some tunes Saturday night with one of the bands on the stage. It was broadcast live on public TV and people recognized me on the street Sunday morning. <laughs> and I never, and I met Yakim the year after that and toured, I've been touring with him for years and years now. And it's just, I love it over there. <laughs> well, you talk quite a bit about um, characters in your book. You have whole chapters mm -hmm. on characters. Uh, and I was smiling through many of them because growing up in Maine, and you've based yourself in Maine as well, there were some wonderful, wonderful um, names that came about, some who are with us, some who have passed. Um, uh, certainly Randy Bean mm -hmm. was a wonderful man. Yeah. Um, much of my musical education was buying books and music yeah. from yeah. his store. And of course, Al Miller with The Theater Project. Yeah. Great, great man. Well, I, I had dinner with Al last night. Yeah, wonderful guy, <laughs> wonderful guy. Um, but of course, I don't think we can get out of here without talking about this gentleman and how you met him at Colby. Yeah, that was, that's Mr. Gillespie himself. Dizzy. Um, so how did you meet Dizzy? Well, it was through the National Endowment that we got a grant. Um, uh, this guy, Larry Ridley, was involved with it uh, to get Dizzy to come up here and do school programs for a week. Mm -hmm. And uh, he stayed at a hotel in, um, in Brunswick, but he, this was at our place in Bodenham. And, um, and we just, uh, he was just the dearest, sweetest guy. And, and uh, uh, we played at the Merrill Auditorium with the, with the Colby big band. And, uh, and I had my, my, my quartet with uh, Steve Grover and John Hutter, I think it was, and Chris Neville. And, um, and Dizzy, and uh, the idea was that we were going to play a couple of tunes, and then and then he'd come out and play one or two tunes for us, and, and um, we played one tune, and I looked over there, and there was Dizzy. <laughs> <laughs> and he, so, uh, and then uh, I saw him a couple of other times, um, and at one point um, he told me if I ever came to New York to come give him a call, and um, I went to uh, gave him a call, and he was playing uh, at the uh, Village Gate. <laughs> And he said, come on in. And uh, so I did. And I went and you know, ushered in. And he's down in the bottom of this thing with his African robes. And, um, and he, um, he said, we're playing Cuban music. And I said, I don't know anything about Cuban music. So we played Cuban music. And there's a, there's a funny story. I can't repeat it in here. No, you can. Just substitute hell. Well, OK. Um, because Dizzy he, says the funniest line in this, this story, but he has to substitute an expletive, so he has to say hell. Yeah, OK. Um, I, I got to think about that. Uh, uh, we, he said, look, Cuban music is, is nothing to it. It's just, you know, you vamp on F7. So, ba -da 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 -da, or the next one, B flat. Ba -ba -ba -da. It's easy, nothing to it. <laughs> All these drummers, about 99 drummers. And when he started to play, they got real busy. The drummers got real busy. And, um, and he'd started one of these incredible lines in And he's about halfway down, he stopped and looked at me and said, where the hell is one? <laughs> and then kept right on playing. <laughs> and I, I mean, I didn't know where one was either. We, I can't count that music. I've got uh, Cuban friends and I don't know where the, where, where the sound. But that was just, and that was not the word he used, but, but um, right. it was just hilarious. It's there. a great story. Now, this is probably the, the oddest picture of Dizzy Gillespie in the world. Isn't that great? Yeah. That's, yeah. Rand, that's, by the way, that's Randy Bean's station wagon. Right, in the yeah. <laughs> just to keep the whole thing together. But you have Dizzy Gillespie riding a goat. Yeah. That picture... Uh, his wife told me that that was on their mantelpiece in, in um, New Jersey until he died. Oh, yeah. yeah. I said, we sent him a big color copy of it. So another character, actually two characters. Uh, one, the great Marshall Dodge, 
um, mm -hmm. really started you on your way um, by generously giving you recording equipment. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was uh, playing with a piano player, uh, Mark Perry, who was a teacher at, Bur at uh, Bowdoin. We'd started a duo, and uh, we were applying for the main touring program. And we went over to the Brunswick Library, and um, Marshall was one of the, you know, what, do you, what do you call it, a judge or a, mm -hmm. adjudicator or one of the, on the committee. And um, I had known him a little bit. He was a year or two ahead of me at St. Paul's School and, um, and a year or two behind my brother, so there was a loose connection. And uh, we, Mark and I played, and I lived in my at back of my mother's house in, in Brunswick at that point. And he asked me if I had any recordings, and I had a vinyl version of the Eddie Thompson thing. And he came over, and he listened to one or two tunes, and he got up, and he looked around, and he said, this is outrageous, and went walking out. <laughs> I said, oh my God, what have I done? And the next day, he showed up in that old Ford station wagon with a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder and a a couple of microphones and a bag of big sh tapes and said, record everything you do. And that was why we have the Lenny Bro stuff. And that's where we're going right now. Before we do, Marshall was exactly like that. Mm -hmm. Walked into your house one time while you were watching a movie with your wife and children. Yeah, that was well, on the, bench, didn't the main say a word. festival. He started the main <laughs> festival. Al Miller was the artistic director and Al got me to be the jazz director. We had jazz by the fountain from the time the festival opened every day till the last last minute Sunday night. And uh, Marshall, as it got a couple of years into it and it got too much red tape and board meetings and he, got, he just hated that part of it. And I was living in Brunswick and we were watching Roots on TV and uh, uh, he showed up, he didn't say hello, he didn't say anything. We were a big waterbed with about my wife and three or four of our kids all watching Roots. And he kicked off his shoes and sat on the edge of the bed and watched Roots, and then he put his shoes on and went away, and he didn't say one <laughs> word. And I felt kind of good about that because he knew that he didn't have to entertain anybody. He could just come and watch Roots. He didn't have to talk. He didn't have to do anything. So I had a, that comfortable a relationship with him, and uh, he, was, he was a treasure. He came, we did a benefit concert for my camp down in Greenwich. And he drove all the way down to Greenwich to, to uh, do a show for us, just for free to raise money. So he's a wonderful, wonderful guy. And because of Marshall, um, the, probably the, the most um, associated recording with, with you are the living room tapes. Yeah, the Lenny Bro. The Lenny, Lenny Bro. Yeah. Um, the first volume came out in 1979. Yeah, I'd have to look in the the, book. Vol the second volume came out in 1986, I believe. Yeah, the CD yeah. came out in 2002 of the complete. Yeah, and in the world of jazz, this is a cult classic. Um, they're absolutely brilliant, and um, I'd like to now show you the only film footage that I could find on online of you playing with Lenny Bro at the main festival. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Oh, this is the Emily one. Yeah, this yeah. is this is Beautiful. Lenny. Lenny's unbelievable.
<laughs> no, I didn't do that. That's all right. All right. There's more? There's more? There no. was more. Okay. That's all right. All right, but this, this, um, this leads me to, to the next series of questions, which listening to you here, you've had really four partners um, that you've played with, and each time I hear you play with those partners, you, you transform hmm. into a different Brad Terry. When you're here with Lenny Bro, when you're with Joaquin Mensel, um, John Basili, and especially when you're with Joaquin Mensel, he brings something out in you yeah. that I've never heard before. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and now, with the partner you've been with for the last five, six years, mm. which is Peter Herman, mm -hmm. brilliant. Um, there's a, a little anecdote story uh, that when Bob Dylan met Jimi Hendrix, uh, he said, um, hey, well, I'm not going to do my Bob Dylan. Um, <laughs> but he said, he said um, do you have any new chords? I've run out of chords. And you have always given off the impression that you, are not, you, you don't want to ever be the front man. You always want to be learning. Mm, that's the whole point. And you have been playing with younger musicians for decades. Mm -hmm. And most of the time that when you play with Joaquin Mensel or Peter Herman, when you hear them do something, you say, why didn't I think of that well, yeah, I've, 40 I've, years ago? I steal from them wholesale all the time. Yeah. Absolutely. And you're learning something from them yeah, yeah, constantly. Yeah. I'm interested in creating and not the least bit interested in recreating. So what I did last week is history. I don't want to know about it. And hopefully when I play next time, it's going to be different and something interesting. Do you practice a lot? Oh, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, what is, I do, is there a no, reason do, why you don't practice? Uh, lazy. No, no, no. Well, uh, no. but I, I heard you once say you don't practice because you don't want to get something so caught in your head that you repeat yeah, yourself well, over and over. Yeah, well, what practicing I do is to get some kind of a thought in my head and try and play it accurately once mm -hmm. and then go on to something else. Because the muscle I'm trying to develop still after all these years, it, you know, I, have a, I have a musical thought here and I want to get it out of the instrument with no middleman. Right. Just let it happen. Um, the whistling is easier because there are no buttons to push. So it's a pretty much translation of what I hear almost instantly mm -hmm. to the whistling thing because it's a, it's a relatively easy instrument to, to, to do. Um, the clarinet is complicated. It's in two different keys. I didn't know that for a while, but it's in two different keys. That just makes it, if, you, if, you, if you're concerned about theory, it makes it difficult. But if somebody doesn't care about theory, it's easy. But uh, <laughs> yeah, the, the bottom half, with the exact, if it's fingering the major scale, is like a, is like a, a, a saxophone, a tenor, a, 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 an alto saxophone. It goes from concert E flat to concert E flat. And you push the register change, and the identical fingering in the upper register is like a tenor saxophone, B flat to B flat. And there are five extra notes in between, and don't ask me why. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a completely, in two, I mean, so octave, uh, octave here, is, you have to, this is an octave, and then the next octave is here. And you, you can't just push the button like an alto or a saxophone. And it's a ridiculous instrument. I don't know why anybody bothers with it. Do you like to, uh, you, you, you said once that you had a teacher that you called the bandstand and, and, uh, and he always liked to be hanging by a thread. Do you always like, do you like that? Yeah, um, well, I, 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 uh, I take chances. Um, um, early on, I was a Goodman clone. I memorized all his solos. Mm -hmm. And I literally, age 16 or 17, literally gave away all my Benny Goodman records and started listening to everything except clarinet players. All the trumpet players, trombone players, I can scat sing Wes Montgomery solos, and I had Jim Hall and Bill Evans and all these people. That's, my, that's where I get my... I recognize Buddy DeFranco in one measure, but I've never tried to copy a solo of another clarinet player. And so if nothing else, I think I've developed a sound and a style that's completely mine. Good or bad, at least it's mine. I don't, I don't sound like anybody else. I hope I don't. And if anybody's playing like me and they're learning from me, it's like, yeah, God, don't do that. <clears throat> when I play gigs, if I have a clarinet player in the house, I, I want them to sit in the back so they won't see all the mistakes I make. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, Eddie Thompson, who mm -hmm. you referred to, 
said one of the greatest quotes about playing uh, Stella by Starlight. He said, the last time I played Stella by Starlight, I lost. <laughs> now, I just had <laughs> drinks with a colleague of mine, and I'm the first to say that the one musical media medium that I have not been able to comfortably learn and play mm -hmm. is jazz. Mm -hmm. Never been able to do it. Mm -hmm. um, we can, we'll have to talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> and in fact, out of all the main musicians, mm -hmm. you and I have played with so many mutual friends, but I have never played with Brad Terry, and Brad Terry has never played with Aaron Robinson. Probably a good reason for that, I'm sure. Well, we'll, have, to, we'll have to fix that. We'll I know. Fix that. Um, however, um, be, and I am so in awe of jazz in what you do. I mean, I, I sit and watch Joaquin Menzel play, and it's just, it just blows mm -hmm. my mind. Mm -hmm. um, have you ever gotten into a piece and become lost? Oh, yeah. Mm. Oh, yeah. I do this thing with uh, Paul Sullivan, mm -hmm. who I think you're going to have here yes, later on. Yes, in September. On. We do a thing called Jazz Jukebox, where we give the audience a list of 200 songs, and they pick whatever they want. And it's hilarious. And sometimes we'll get to the a middle of a bridge to a tune, and we'll look at each other and realize that neither one of them, they don't, we don't know where it goes next. <laughs> <laughs> so so he'll, he'll just play some chords. We just either a Sears Roebuck or a Montgomery Ward <laughs> bridge. We're just making, you hope that you play eight measures and you come back in the right key so that, you're, that the rest of the tune fits. And we just look at each other and, and just let her rip and see what happens. And uh, with, I mean, Paul listens. Uh, another, another thing <clears throat> I believe with the, the successful duo playing is a 60-40 relationship, 60% mm -hmm. listening. Right. And if both people are listening at 60%, uh, then what happens in the, in the middle can be magical. 50-50 uh, is relatively easy to do. But when it really gets to the point where you, and, and I'm not the, by any means the greatest clarinet player, but uh, I don't have to think about fingering and technique. I mean, I hear it, that's the practicing I say. The practicing I do is to get the thought here out the instrument with no middleman. Mm -hmm. So if I hear something from Piaquim, I can throw it back at him because I'm listening to him more than I'm worrying about what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And that, if, if you can get that going, and I can do that with Peter Herman, and I did it with John Basile, and obviously with Lenny. And um, that's, that's what's fun. <laughs> well, I started out this evening by saying that the, the first time that I met you, Brad, uh, was in high school. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I have known about you is not the fact that you are, are a world-class jazz whistler and clarinetist, uh, but that you have given back to the youth of not only this area in Maine, but of the world, because you traveled to Poland and have for yeah. over 20 years. Um, we don't have time this evening, uh, but I would, I'm going to just show a couple uh, pictures of some of the youth in, Por uh, in Poland. Um, Brad has really dedicated his life to teaching and giving back. Uh, I would love to just keep talking and, and asking you questions as to why, and maybe it comes from all those teachers who didn't uh, <laughs> do what you do in those children's lives. Yeah. Um, but it's amazing. You, you had a, a boys' camp for 25 years mm -hmm. here in Maine. Mm -hmm. um, did a tremendous, it's all in this book. It's just phenomenal. Uh, but these young, uh, oh, there's Lenny Bro. Fabulous. Um, but yeah. there's you, you know that the, there's a quick, quick story about Lenny that, that uh, uh, Les Paul, came out with How High the Moon, and it was the first ever overdubbed recording. He invented that whole process of playing a tune into a tape recorder, then you play that into another tape recorder, and you ended up with multiple tracks. His wife, Mary Ford, sang harmony and, and a melody, three, two harmony parts, and Lenny, um, and Les Paul had three guitar tracks. And Lenny was in junior high school, heard it on the radio, and liked it, and learned how to do it and nobody told him it was three guitars. Yeah. <laughs> and Peter Herman, Peter Herman is doing a lot of the same stuff. There's stuff on the, on the, the living room tapes. You, there's, well, there's a wonderful bass player, but who's playing the chord and the melody? Yeah. And it's all Lenny. <laughs> and, uh, now, these three young um, 
Those are my Polish, my Polish whiz kids. Who, who are now still traveling the world. Yeah. Michael, and the bass player, the, the, he, those, they were 13 and 15. The piano player is 13 and the other two are 15. And you first... made a CD with them that is so miraculous that when you play that CD for people, you then have to tell them the age of these youth. Yeah. Because Nobody they don't, believe, no one would believe, believe how good Michael they are. Michael is now the number one bass player in Poland. He's won all the polls. Uh, Mateusz, the piano player, um, he was, well, most piano players, when they uh, do the Chopin scherzos and etudes when they graduate from Oberlin or Juilliard, he did them all in competition when he was 14. And um, he was, I showed him, uh, he, his first tune was Body and Soul, which he played brilliantly all the way through. Then he came in the bridge, the middle part, and, and ended it. That was it. That was jazz. And I said, no, keep it going, keep the form going. Uh, when he was 18, he was house pianist at the Montreux Jazz Festival. <laughs> yeah. And he's just a brilliant. And uh, Tomek, the drummer, um, has a rock and roll band that's on all the charts. You look him up, Tomek Torres. Mm -hmm. His father's Cuban. Um, he has a fantastic Cuban band. Um, and Tomek also plays with Michael and some of the best jazz players. He's a, so he's a, but they started them in music school, full-time music school in Poland in third grade. Mm. And they, start, they all have to start with piano. And they play, have to play certain pieces at a certain level. And they kick them out. And, Tomek, and they have to play piano all the way through. So Michael picked up cello in, in, in fourth grade. And Tomek picked up percussion. And um, he, uh, he, he was playing Carmen variations with four mallets on a marimba. They had all that stuff going on. And then you set him loose on a drum set and look out, you know. Ah, three languages, four instruments. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Unbelievable. This is what I admire most about you. That picture? That picture. That's Matthias the day I met him. Yeah. He was 11 years old and uh, had to sit right on the edge of the, of the bench to reach the pedals. <laughs> Giving back to the youth, yeah, though. Yeah. That's yeah. the most important. Um, and now, though, to end the uh, evening, there's, there's something else that you also do, not just for uh, humankind, but for pet kind. And she's sitting right over to your right. <laughs> and this little darling here came to you, uh, and she's a miracle. Yeah, she really is. She really is a miracle. And we're going to watch a little slide, because uh, a little <coughs> slideshow, because um, Ella did not always look like this. Brad rescued her, and you've had dogs all your life. Uh, you've, you've had dogs next to you, and you once said, um, someone asked you, uh, is that your dog? And you answered? Oh, I, my stock answer is no. That's my friend. Yeah. It has nothing to do with ownership. Right. And uh, she's, just, she's, just a, she's just a good buddy, and she's... Uh, but you found this dog um, crated, very much abused. Yeah. And we're going to show you what Brad has done since August with this dog um, and see the transformation. I went this is. <laughs> oh, I don't know, man. This is tough to watch. That was in Washington, D.C. last week. <laughs> She's a miracle. Uh, they're talking about you. She was on death's door. Yeah, yeah. I, I picked her up and, and uh, took her to a vet um, and um, didn't know whether I was bringing her home or have, leaving her there to be put down. And uh, that was the 26th of August. And here she is. Yeah. And, uh, we all follow her on Facebook. <laughs> so, uh, Brad, before we get into the Q&A with the audience, mm. and hopefully you'll play a little bit, um, I always ask my uh, guests ten questions. 
rapid fire. <laughs> so I hope you're up for it. Okay, okay. Here we go. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> mm -hmm. And this is um, through Marcel Are these Proust. easy multiple choice or yes or no questions? <laughs> this is up to you. Uh-oh. So um, what turns you on creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? Oh, boy. Hmm. I don't know. That, that's, a, that's a tough question. Um, I've boiled down um, sort of my philosophy of, of, of uh, down into two words, really, um, that of consideration and tolerance. Mm -hmm. And you throw in some humility. And if you have consideration and tolerance, you don't need any other laws or any other rules or any other guides. That, that covers everything. I don't know if that answers the question. There are no correct answers. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm, what? If, you, if you added up my grades in school, <laughs> they would look pretty good, but then you divide by the number of classes and you got right. down to the single digits again. So I'm glad this is no... Uh. So if that's what turns you on creatively, spiritually, emotionally, what turns you off? Oh, uh, I would think uh, dishonesty. Mm -hmm. If you could have played with any musician, living or dead, who would it be and why? I regret I never got a chance to play with Jim Hall mm -hmm. because he was, well, he was instrumental in, in you know, stylistically, very much. Uh, I, I saw him a couple of times. And uh, I had a gig in, with John Basile in New York, and uh, Jim Hall was in the front row the whole time we were there, which is a little intimidating. But I think, uh, um, and I never got a chance to play with Bill Evans. Oh, yeah. Who is probably musically my most important influence. Mm. Straight, you know, with, uh, somebody said when Bill Evans played a tune, it became the definitive way to play the tune, <laughs> yes. which I like. And then that somebody else said that some piano players have to play all 88 notes before they find the right one. Mm -hmm. And Bill Evans, Bill Evans can go like that, and it's, that's it. <laughs> so um, it's, I, I would think Bill Evans would be one that I would really, really have enjoyed to play with. Uh, what is your favorite chord or key? Oh, that's, you can't answer that. Of course you can. No. Because you're going to tell me what is your least favorite chord or key. Well, okay, E, A, what, no, what, B. Was that pre wait a minute. Is that, for the man who said, I can't tell you, we just listed off three. Now, wait a minute. What is your favorite chord or key? Well, anything except those guitar keys. Oh, th that was your least favorite? Yeah. I thought you said F sharp was. No, F, well, F sharp, E, A, B, and F sharp. Those are, the, those, are the, those are the killer. That's why the symphony guys have an A clarinet. Right, yeah. And so the, for the sharp keys. Right. And um, I mean, it, I remember years ago trying to play blues in concert G, and I absolutely couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. Yeah. And, and uh, um, well, and I, I showed the, the, one of the first tunes I learned was, Sweet, uh, was um, uh, Dark Town Strutter's Ball. Mm -hmm. And it starts on. Well, I, I, I also learned what little now I know about clarinet on, in concert pitch. So I know where middle C is. It sounds like this on the clarinet. That's got to be C. <laughs> Why not? It makes Why sense. Why not? Right. And Darktown Strutter's Ball, it would go ba ba ba, and then you had to make the register change. And I, I just I couldn't do the register change. It was, you know, it was just starting out. So I had to learn to improvise. So I couldn't, I couldn't do that. <laughs> and I had to learn to improvise. So the, the guitar player keys are terrible. And I'm reasonably comfortable in, therefore, eight out of 12 keys. Mm -hmm. And um, within the limits of the clarinet, I mean, it does get complicated when you start getting into the sharp keys. I can pretty much play any tune I know in any key. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Uh, what profession, other than your own, would you like to attempt? God, I don't know. I think when I was about 18 or so, I decided I never wanted to work for a living. <laughs> and in other words, when I went to a job solely for the sake of the paycheck, that was, that was, that was it. I didn't want to bother with it. And I wanted to do something that I loved, and I was willing to work really hard, but it had to be something I wanted to do. So the teaching, I taught for five years at a school in New York and got practically no money and loved it. Mm -hmm. So a teacher? Uh, yeah, I taught English. No, but is that the profession you would like to do other than this? Uh, well, I think, I think I am. I think I do anyway. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, I think between, I think if I had to choose between performing and teaching, it would be a really tough decision if I had to do one or the other. So what sound or noise do you love? Hmm. I like uh, the, um, I like the sound of my coffee pot in the morning. <laughs> and I got an old fashioned grinder and that sounds great too. What sound or noise do, do you hate? Um, I can quote uh, um, Buddy Rich. Uh, he, had a, um, he had several heart attacks. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and the story is that uh, on his way to the, <clears throat> to the operating room on his last and final and fatal heart attack, somebody asked him what he was allergic to, and he said country and western music. <laughs> so, and, and died almost immediately afterwards. So, well, and you know, you, there, there's, you know, how can I miss you if you don't go away? That's one of them. <laughs> and uh, my favorite country and western song is "If the phone doesn't ring, you'll know it was me." Right. I think that's one of my. That's one of my. It's one of my. One of my favorites. Um, how would you like to be remembered? Um, I hope that when the dust settles for me, that the, either I owe everybody a cup of coffee or they owe me a cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. That we're pretty, pretty even. I, I, I hope it works out that way. And if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Hmm. It's about time. Oh. Okay. <laughs> no, that's, I don't think that's, I, I think that's a very hypothetical. <laughs> that's okay. That's all right. Well, we're coming to the end of the evening, and like Ella, I need to go out. So, I thank you so much. Um, for coming this evening. I thank Brad oh, thank um, you. and both Ella thank for you. being here. Thank you, Lincoln Theater. Thank you again. Mm -hmm. We'll see you in the fall with Paul Sullivan. Good night, everybody. Thank, thank you, you very Brad. much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wonderful. Great. Right. Thank you. Ella, where are you going?